a little bit about why I think it's so useful to hear from Joey is for those that aren't familiar with uh, the lab that is, the, like there's a primordial soup of the valley and particularly around key technologies at Berkeley. It started you know, originally as, a, uh, as the AMP lab, then moved into the Sky Lab, or the RISE lab, and then moved into the Sky Lab. And if you've heard about sort of seminal technologies, some of you know that obviously the story of Databricks comes out of there. Many, many other things, uh, uh, scaled, scale.ai, many other, th uh, well, we can go, we'll go through a little bit of that. But the, the, um, the other thing is, it was just a year ago that Joey and his students released the major open source model, Yakuna. And, and then following on that was the chatbot arena and LLM sys environment. And then if we look at his students, you know, we often talk about like the PayPal mafia, the LinkedIn mafia, the Uber mafia. There's a Berkeley mafia. And if you look at the, all the authors on all these key papers, you, they're kind of gone on to all the seminal places uh, uh, if you kind of look at, I forgot what the valuation of all those those students are, but it's something stunning. So, so what we wanted to do with getting Joey here is to have kind of conversation through his eyes, both as you know founder, but seeing this arc of trajectory that is happening at the academic layer to get a sense of well, how do you compete with Nvidia, this cloud, all these other players? Uh, uh, for those that have jobs there. We're coming for you. Yep. No, really. Uh, no, that, uh, but like, it's like, uh, like, how do we think about this as an ecosystem? So, Joey, uh, let me just first add: Is there anything that you'd like to add from your perspective of like the landscape, how you're approaching this? Yeah, so there's a lot I'd like to add. So, uh, and I, I'm excited to be here. And I guess my quick disclosure: I'm a professor, so I say crazy stuff all the time. Um, some of it's true. <laughs> uh, the, but, but often cited. <laughs> but we cite exactly. Citations are important. Um, so, uh, yeah, so my lab at Berkeley is doing a lot of exciting research and trying to keep up with a very uh, rapidly changing and often expensive landscape. Um, and so we think a lot about what it means to contribute intellectually and also advance the field technologically. Um, I, I think the kind of the, the neat hallmark of our labs at Berkeley is we have a, a history of not just writing papers, though we do that and we write great papers, they get widely cited, uh, but we build software, build technology, and then we have amazing students that graduate uh, and go on to be professors, but many go on to be entrepreneurs and take that technology into the world. Um, and that's something that's kind of central to our DNA and it's something that as the, the dynamics of, the, of technology have changed where you know, the cost of building these technologies has gone six, six, significantly higher, we have to revisit how we approach these problems. Mm -hmm. And I think the punchline, hopefully we'll get this through the, the whole session today, is that there is a lot of opportunity for innovation. Um, and maybe an analogy I'll start with and we'll go back to some of the projects. If we think of uh, you know, the history of computing, there's been many of these eras where technology gets better and better and all of a sudden uh, big players take over a piece of the space. But then over time those big players get you know, small entrants that, that start to, to push them aside. Uh, and then maybe more critically on top of those big players, we see new technologies emerge. So take you know, hardware, we have the, the processor, a lot of people are competing on processors and then a few big players take over the processor space. And then we have a whole software industry flourish on top of these more unified processors. And then eventually, you know, groups from Berkeley, like the risk, you know, the sci-fi project, come in and start to displace the, that technology space at its core. Um, and we also see, maybe in the processor space, innovation in uh, very specialized application areas, which again mirrors what we're seeing in AI today. The cloud had a, a similar analogy, right? Uh, you know, at some point, everyone had their own data center. Like, well, why do you have your own data center? How would you possibly compete with that big cloud provider, Amazon? Uh, and so people build stuff on top of the cloud. And so again, we see innovation move up the stack. Uh, and then meanwhile, we see that the stack itself start to evolve and there's now many cloud providers and, and more specialized clouds that offer you know, specific services. So to draw an analogy and maybe kind of a, a level setting for our conversation today, when I look at AI, uh, I am both, you know, I'm terrified because I thought we were building the chips, we were building the, the, the data centers and we were building the models that should be the foundation. Uh, and we are, we're do, still doing work in that space, but it's more specialized. Uh, what I see a lot of excitement around is building things on top of it. And I see that both at Berkeley and the research that we're doing and also in entrepreneurial activities as well. Um, well, let's, maybe let's, because it's such a, sem it's hard to believe it was just a year ago, spring break a year ago. Yep. And, and so maybe, ta uh, yeah, literally this week, <laughs> yep. is uh, walk us through that, like what the last year and a quarter has been since ChatGPT 
yeah. was officially launched. 2023 was a big year for, for my lab. Uh, I will say going into 2023, a lot of my research was on uh, working on large scale training systems. We were working on uh, tooling around machine learning workflows, uh, how to integrate with data analytics pipelines. Um, in spring break of 2023, a few of my grad students uh, saw a project from another group at Stanford. It's another school in the South. Uh, South Heard of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they also do interesting computer science research. Uh, and they had built this, this project, Alpaca, where they took a model released by Meta, the, the, the Llama model. Um, and they had, the Stanford group had uh, fine-tuned that model to be more chatty. Uh, we have ChatGPT come out, and people are like, I wish I had access to ChatGPT. Our colleagues at Stanford fine-tune a model with some data sets they created, and it, it can kind of chat. Students in my group are like, we can do better than that. Uh, the trick to AI is what? It's data. And so my students are like, okay, well, so if we want to be better than, than Stanford, which we do, uh, we need a better data set. And they found uh, a data set called ShareGPT. Uh, and for those who don't know, ShareGPT, when ChatGPT first came out, it made it hard, ChatGPT was hard to share your conversations. By the way, if you're launching a company, make it easy to share what you're doing. Um, anyways, so ChatGPT didn't offer the ability to share conversations. So this website, ShareGPT, would just scrape your ChatGPT conversation. You could you know, Slack it or message it to a friend, and they could, oh, cool, that was a fun conversation. Well, that's really impressive. Uh, they had accumulated about 700 megabytes of good, quali good quality conversation data. Uh, my students scraped that website using the tools that were available on the website. It was designed to be scraped uh, and cleaned that data. So they spent a lot of time making sure the data was well, well formatted. And then they fine-tuned, in fact, they borrowed the, the, and cited the Alpaca training scripts, uh, but with our new data set. And in doing that, we built a model that was significantly better than uh, Alpaca. It was way better than Llama at just raw conversation. It was entertaining, almost engaging. Uh, and we thought we had something exciting. In fact, my students like, hey, we got to release this right now. I'm like, I don't know if we, do we trust you know, this let's, model? Let's talk a little bit at parameter wise. Yeah. Wall clock to wall clock. Oh, uh, so uh, time to train? Yeah, time yeah. to train. Like the total start of project yeah. to the moment you're like, hey, should break. we? It was three days. Three days. To model. How, yeah. many, how many dollars? Uh, a few, it was a few hundred dollars. There, there's some resets as they were doing and, and tuning, yeah. but uh, I think it was a thousand. Let's call it under time. a thousand dollars. Yeah. How many students? It was Two, three students working on it. Yep. Okay, so three yep. students, three FTE. Yep. A few a thousand uh, dollars. Thousand dollars. Yep. And suddenly you're you're now able to be llama. Yeah, we're, we're, we we have a model data. that is uh, good, uh, and and for us the next question was, is it good enough? Which essentially launched a whole line of research and, and changed the way my whole lab was 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 going. Um, but initially it was really exciting. We had a model uh, that was it seemed good. Uh, later on, colleagues at a company, Google, uh, start to look at this, and they had a, a slightly larger investment in their modeling efforts, and our model was pretty comparable to what they were doing. Uh, now, granted, it's important to note that our model is trained on really good data, a key, key insight that has remained true throughout all the work we've done with LLMs. is data quality matters, uh, and how we build really good LLMs is, is, is around how we uh, curate, augment, and improve our data. Uh, so that, that's an important lesson that we've learned and we continue to learn. Uh, I think this is actually, we'll, we'll just put a pin on that. We'll come back to this because I, I just want for the audience. This is turning out to be a far more critical thing I think we're learning mm -hmm. everywhere uh, than, than people fully appreciate is the importance of data quality. But keep going. Yeah, so uh, we had better data. We had what we thought was a better model. Uh, and this is still early and students are very excited to release it. And so is it better? <laughs> so how do we know? Uh, and the first thing like we chatted with it seems better. Uh, I was like, we should do a user study. User studies are expensive. You have to get stuff set up. So it's like, I don't want to do that. Um, so they came with another idea, which was kind of silly, but turned out to be actually uh, led into a whole, whole new line of research. Is they said, well, let's just ask GPT if it's better. Uh, so they went to GPT, I guess three, four, maybe four had just come out or was it on its way out. It's like asking my teenage kids, yeah. are they better than me? Well, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know what answer I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, so that was a bias we later on realized was a serious problem, but uh, <laughs> we'll come back to that too. Uh, there was a follow on paper about how we did all this wrong, but um, let me tell you how we did it wrong first. Uh, so we, we asked GPT, uh, here's two outputs from two AIs, which one is better? And we actually asked it to give a quantitative analysis of the differences. Um, and it, it, it generally preferred our model, actually significantly preferred our model over our, our colleagues in the South Bay, the, the Stanford Alpaca model. Uh, it was better, of course, than the, the base meta model. And it, it was often comparable to GPT 3.5. Uh, 
uh, or GPT-3, I guess, at that point. So comparing against the, the, the base GPT-3 model. Um, about 90% of the time, it was kind of on average with what GPT would, would have had. So it was close to the performance of this chat model. And when people chatted with it, when we played with it, it was pretty good. Uh, so we initially released the model, and, and the silly benchmark turns out to be a pretty clever idea of, of asking LMs to evaluate themselves. Uh, and it took off. I, I, my, my reaction was Google was pissed. Yeah, so there were some blogs. There was an internal memo at Google that like, cited the blog. We, had, we didn't even write a paper at this point. We just had a, a, like a bar chart comparing our, our, you know, our model and the Stanford model. And it was in, you know, cited in, in the internal Google discussion as like, how is a group at a university with a very limited budget and a few students competing with something we're doing? Uh, and again, the answer, data. We had really good data. That data was uh, partially synthetic, so we should refer, return to the share GPT data, is data with really good human conversations. So I asked a, a funny question. Chat GPT, so we're learning to be like Chat GPT, which has its downsides. We should come back to that as well. Um, good answers. And then maybe more critically, follow-up conversations. So these weren't just, you know, hi, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, end of conversation. But there are long dialogues. And they were also curated. They were what humans thought were great conversations. Uh, so we had really good labels on high quality data. And that built, allowed us to build a, a pretty good model out of the box. And so again, number one lesson, data. Uh, this project uh, took over more than I thought it would. Uh, we knew that if we released something that was comparable to GPT-3 that was public, people would be like, oh, that's exciting. Uh, what I didn't think is that people would then take that and build a whole bunch of stuff on top of it. I thought it was just an exercise in kind of demonstrating the value of data and getting a model out uh, that people could study. But it, it did change. So a lot of the research community got excited because they had a model that was you know, good enough to start doing things like adding uh, vision support, extending it for new domains, making it a little bit more vulgar. Uh, so lots of, of work was built on top of those weights. Did you have to worry about alignment issues here? Or I, I, I know, Joe, you and I have had a lot yeah. of, we'll get to a little bit of this hopefully, because <laughs> you and I have been in a bunch of conversations around AI governance. Um, at different different levels, uh, but I, as you're doing this, I know you had a lot of concerns initially about should we release it. So you know you you hear about this in in startups and other places like we should just go and gas or brakes. How how did you navigate this? It's complicated. I remember many calls with the students, uh, which were you know they had spent their spring break on this a little bit of it. They're really excited to get this out. It was a neat result, uh, so we wanted to get it to the world. Uh, we were worried initially about the data itself, like what's, can we use this data, how, how we, the pieces we put together can release them, what's the right licensing for that. That was complicated. I don't know if we, we ultimately found the best solution. Um, so we navigated that for a while. Uh, there were some alignment issues, actually a silly alignment issue. Um, if you asked our model, who created you? What do you think it said? I was created by OpenAI. Uh, so it, it parroted back the OpenAI response because it had been fine-tuned to, fine to do that. Um, some of my colleagues in another group at Berkeley, in fact, colleagues, the, the same group of students that built this model, were develop, mo developing a similar pipeline uh, they called the Koala model. Um, they were smart enough to retrain the model to say, I was created by researchers at UC Berkeley. Um, so some just basic data augmentation, again, was, was needed to, to fix the quality of the model. Um, we didn't go as deep into the raw, is this uh, aligned with human values as I think we should have. Uh, the good news is the data set we built it from was based on things that people felt like they should share. So at least interesting. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they were shared for good reasons. People might have shared conversations for bad reasons as well. Do you have advice for people? On how to approach this now? On how to approach this now. Like you, you, you went through a pretty extensive, mm -hmm. I mean, the launch of this was kind of crazy, yep. and especially because of the heat that was coming at you by OpenAI. Yep. Like you, were, you were literally in this arena. <laughs> <laughs> this the gladiator arena around this with people yeah. who had billions of dollars invested against you and a couple so, of grad students. One of the things that came out of the alignment question, I guess this is worth noting, is uh, our first evaluation was asking GPT. Uh, and there were some flaws in that. And I'll come back to those flaws. Uh, we needed to check against human alignment. Uh, and so the arena was kind of our second step to doing that. So when we released the model, we actually had launched a little website, a Gradio demo that people could chat against our model, the Stanford model, and uh, the other Berkeley model that was just developed kind of contemporaneously. Um, so we had all three models out. Uh, people were, were enjoying chatting with them. And at some point, someone was like, can I chat to two at once just to compare them? I'm like, all right. So we added the ability to chat to two at once. We always had a, bottom at the, a button at the bottom of the interface. You could say, good model, bad model, good response, bad response. Uh, I think it was one of our meetings like, 
what if we didn't show which models you were chatting with? Uh, we'll just put them up blindly and let you chat with two random models. Uh, like a taste test. Like a taste test. You get model A, model B, you say, hey, how's it going? Explain why UC Berkeley is the best place to study blah. And, and it would say, oh, UC Berkeley is far better, and the other one goes, Stanford's better. Like, okay, I prefer the UC Berkeley answer. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get human preference about each of these, uh, these models. So you put this up, and people started using it, which I was kind of surprised. Like, I guess that, you know, they're having fun voting against models. And then we, we developed, uh, we took the ELO rating system from Chess and reapplied it to all these rankings that we got. And we got a, a pretty interesting ranking of models. So we had our open source models. We decided, you know what, maybe we should put OpenAI in the list. So we added uh, OpenAI's models. We started adding some of the other commercial models. Google, as they developed them, came out, or we added them to our arena. Um, and it took off. And now many, many models, in fact, if a startup has a model, they're like, hey, can you guys add it to the arena? We'd love to you know, get it on the arena. We can give you access to our APIs. The big cloud providers are like, hey, we'd love to have our model on the arena to see how it ranks. Uh, so everyone's adding models to this arena, and we are collecting a really good uh, human alignment assessment. I say, I should caveat, really good asterisk. So it is a in the wild. So anyone, you can go to chat.lmsys.org right now and chat with any pair of models you want. Um, please use the blind chat. You have an option to pick the models, but then we can't use your rating. Um, if you use the blind chat, we will pick random strong models and, and have them compete for the best answer. Uh, this becomes a source of signal, again, in the wild, uh, of open conversations. You, we don't tell you what to ask. You ask whatever you want. Tell me a joke. Do something bad. Uh, all of these things are, are open for you to ask. Uh, we get signal. Uh, and we've made all that data public. So people building models in the future can build on top of these rankings, on top of the votes that we get, and on top of the conversations that people ask against these, these data. Well, you can, at this point, you, you know, even though you're, you're, you guys are playing in, the, in, this, uh, in this way, I don't use that pejoratively at all. It's, it's like the learning, mm -hmm. explore, yeah. or the exploration of these ideas. And this becomes a national security question. Uh oh. Right, because all of a sudden you have Eric Schmidt on some sides. It's like big people saying open source models are terrible. They're very dangerous. We're going to have people using them. Uh, you have investors who are saying no closed source. You have others. Uh, like the, the world sort of splits into two camps effectively. And so, you know, as we kind of return, I want to return a little bit to this, this question of we have really entrenched players and what is the... The, uh, like, how do you build in this day and age when you have these massive players and you have the government also looking at you and, and, and this, this intensity scrutiny? Um, rather than what's happening, what's your advice to people as they're out there taking on these challenges since you've been in this, this, this sort of the thick of it? Yeah, it's a great question. So if we, let's just focus on model development for a second, because that's an exciting area. It's important that we have more than one model uh, that's the best model that are competing. Um, there's the big commercial vendors that are building, uh, you know, the, the, the Microsofts, the Googles, the, their, their, their core models. Um, I will say, actually, I just checked the arena, and the number one model in the arena is not by a major commercial vendor right now. Uh, I think just as of a few days ago, it switched to Anthropic, uh, actually has the top model in the arena. So it beat GPT-4's latest model. Um, so it is changing. Uh, you can be a small company and build a model that competes. Uh, small is, is a relative term. Uh, the good news uh, for many of us uh, building models uh, is that the open source model world is still very thriving. It's vibrant. I, I was actually very worried about the health of the open source community because these foundation models are expensive to train. But our colleagues at Meta have been generous enough to release models, and, and many of the startups that have been developing some of these very competitive models are also releasing open source versions. Sometimes the open source version is not as good. It won't rank as high in the arena, but the arena is asking all knowledge, general applications. Uh, in many cases, these specialized models can be tuned to be very good, better than the state-of-the-art models at specific tasks. And in my group, we've started looking at things like tool use, function calling, the Gorilla project, uh, in these we were able to fine tune Llama 7B, not even the best open source model at this point, uh, to be better than GPT-4 at calling specific functions or calling sets of libraries. Um, so there is an opportunity for smaller organizations to take these smaller models and tune them. They run on an, on a, an iPad, so it's like the scales, the efficiencies of our systems are getting better to the point where you can work with these technologies without having the I mean, you are it. actually running it on your iPad. Uh, not this iPad. Uh, but, I need but, to but, update but, it. But in general, like, yeah. you, you are, like the students are actually saying, yeah. hey, I'm not going to just tolerate this 
uh, I need to sit here and deal with the scarcity of GPUs, yep. I am going to figure out how to get this to actually work on this small, this yep. small footprint. Many of my students have asked for new laptops in the past year uh, to support the, their LM research. So yeah, it, it can run on, on devices. We find ways to, to uh, run them on a single GPU for batch processing. Um, there's a lot of exciting research now on how to make these medium-sized models much more accessible. This is why I think actually part of the federal policy of like parameter sort of capping at parameters doesn't seem to be a good policy decision anymore. Yeah, let's, I, I'm, all right, I used to be worried that open source wouldn't succeed because of the high costs. And, and I'm still concerned that, you know, these base models need to be developed and, and we need people funding that, that process or that, that progress. Um, I'm now worried about regulation. Uh, I think it's important that we have innovation. I think we probably do need regulation. I don't know how to do it yet. Uh, and, and I've thought a lot about it. Um, choosing the model size seems like an odd way to regulate. Choosing number of flops is a very odd way to regulate these technologies. Uh, I've heard things about like maybe the weight should be closed, but I will tell you, and we should go into this, that uh, it turns out fine tuning is actually pretty critical to unlocking a lot of the capabilities. Um, so having access to the weights is important. Uh, if I can take Vicuña and I can release our, one of our open source models, I can do all the vetting and red teaming I want on that model. Uh, you can fine tune that model to do all the things that I thought it couldn't do. Um, and so because you have the ability to teach a model something, you can teach it bad things. Uh, and so the idea that uh, we can't allow fine tuning, you know, it, if we don't allow fine tuning, we have a real problem. Um, but if we allow fine tuning, we also have a real problem. There's no way to say this model is safe. Um, so I think maybe the bigger threat now is, is kind of the regulatory landscape as it tries to evolve and respond to the evolution of these technologies. Is there any particular framework or line of thinking that you, you find yourself saying, ah, that, that's, a, that's the one that has the, the richest depth of thinking? For regulatory. For regulatory. It's a good question. Um, I like the idea of focusing more on the use case. Uh, so the model of the technology itself, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine how you'd regulate a matrix. Um, but how you apply a matrix, which is the tensors, the core parts of these things, that I can regulate. You can say, look, if you're using an LM to make this kind of decision, uh, there should be guardrails on, on how you make that decision. Um, it might mean that you can't use the LM purely to do that thing, that that's possibly okay. Uh, so I'm more excited about approaches to how we regulate the use of these technologies and, le and less about how we re regulate the, the core data, the technologies itself. So um, you're also wearing a hat as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, talk to us about the startup and bring that into the, the, this, this fold because there you're also, you're not just trying to write papers, yep. you're trying to win in the market. And so you're also going up against very well-funded uh, co corporations yep. uh, and, and against supply chain issues of GPUs and talent. You've got to hire talent. Yep. So uh, I have a company, Run LLM, um, and I guess the story of the company is kind of fun. It was launched as many of the, 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 the lab, the UC Berkeley labs, tend to launch companies because a large fraction of students who are building software want to go out and take that software and commercialize it. Um, one of my star students wanted to commercialize some cloud technologies for managing uh, serverless compute in the cloud. Um, that built on some of the stuff we were doing for inference long before inference was hot. Uh, and so we launched a company around that, uh, focusing on these kind of operationalization of machine learning tools. Uh, the reality as the landscape evolved and as people you know, pivoted towards uh, generative AI is that it's not just the tools, but really how you use them. So today, Run LLM focuses on building these very uh, customized developer assistants that are able to learn about, because we use fine tuning on top of RAG and all these other technologies we're developing in research, um, be able to learn about your data, your organizational complexities, uh, the you know, discussions on, on Git, on Slack, and incorporate all that information as it tries to help you, know, you and, and potentially your users work with, uh, with your technology. Um, so you can think of it as a really smart assistant that understands you and your business uh, really well. How do we do that? We need fine tuning, we need RAG, we need all of these technologies. Um, right now, the way we're doing it, and I would encourage many to, to start here, is we actually build on top of the best systems out there. So we build on top of Anthropic, we build on top of OpenAI. Um, all of these, these big organizations have realized that fine tuning is also important. They've realized that the orchestration of these technologies is where, where innovation is happening. And so they've made it easier to do that. And so we can fine tune models to really understand your coding styles and documentation. We can stitch those models together to build really impressive applications that go out and call tools that do interesting stuff. 
Um, and we're building right now, and, and to get to the regulatory question, we're, we're focusing a lot around the developer space because it's, it's a space where you can ha have, in some sense, the lowest risk. Uh, so we're, we're helping developers make decisions, they're smart people, um, guiding them to, through thought processes. We're not yet helping physicians decide how to diagnose a patient. We're not helping you know, sales teams yet decide you know, which customers to, to maybe focus on or, or deprioritize. Um, in the future, those are directions that these kinds of technologies will explore, but finding places where we can have a lot of impact, demonstrate the, the progress that these technologies can have for a large organization is in some sense more critical than, than chasing some of these potentially riskier and, and things that need more thought in, in how we do them. So we're gonna take a couple questions in just a few minutes. So if you have one, uh, how, are we, how do we wanna do it? Just, okay, uh, yeah. Pete, Pete will be our, our show runner here. Uh, or mic runner. So um, uh, if you've got, you get, maybe you raise your hand or someone might peek and find you. Um, so the, the um, I want to talk about winners and losers mm. because this is a really interesting week. Uh, it, like every week in AI is obviously very interesting, but this week in particular we had inflection. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't even know what you want to call it. Aqua higher collapse, I don't know yeah. like what the exact word is here. Um, you have stability going through a lot of, uh, of, um, of instability. instability. <laughs> that's, I think that's the only way we could say it. Yeah. Uh, but then also we've seen, uh, we've seen kind of two other trends is the, the, there's a coalition of, of different big players coming together to say, hey, we want to, to create a new entity to go after NVIDIA. And then we've also started to see um, the questions around the CFO in big corporations who are like, am I really getting the value of, of, the, uh, of this AI? And uh, prove, start asking, like, prove to me that this is a good strategy. So I wonder if this is like, is this a market correction that's coming? Is this a world? And, 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 and the reason I want to ask you this specifically for who, how do you think about winners and losers is because you have the best sense of this because you're watching the students and where their hearts and minds are going. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is an interesting time, as I guess it always is in AI, but uh, I think we are seeing people start to assess where the actual tangible value is in these technologies, because uh, there was a lot of excitement about what it could be, and now people are asking, but what is it? Uh, when, when we, and in fact, when Run LM thought about this, again, we were, were tool builders, we were systems builders. Uh, our natural inclination is to build, you know, if we use the gold brush analogy, the picks and shovels. Um, we went to companies like, that's a great, pick you have there, we're not sure exactly what to do with it yet. Uh, and I think that was something that was a big signal to us that, you know, it's an exciting time to be innovating, uh, and maybe it's a really good time to be, you know, actually going after gold. Um, and where the gold rush analogy sort of falls apart, and for those who don't know, the, the gold rush analogy would argue that, you know, if you, it's a gold rush, you should sell picks and shovels because everyone needs those. Levi Strauss. Exactly, don't, yeah. Don't, Very successful. Yeah. Uh, the reality is that gold and AI are very different. Critically in that if you have gold, you know how to sell it, uh, and it has a, a well-defined value. AI doesn't, and I think that's where we're starting to struggle, is that uh, we have really cool technology, there's an immense potential, but what do you do with it? And where are the applications landing? Uh, is starting to make some of the bigger companies question, like, what is the, the maybe more immediate value of what we're doing? Uh, we've seen things like Copilot, these developer assistants have done remarkably well, which is a good signal to us as well, that, that you know, there's a market where people are willing and able to embrace these technologies early and have done so and seen immediate value. If you take those away, you're like, I don't, my job is, I pay for that. I'd like that back, please. Um, but if you look at, you know, chat assistance, it's still, you know, in, in the general, it's still unclear how much that, you know, the market values that as a whole. When I look at my students, uh, there is a lot of excitement around the core infrastructure because we are system builders. But a lot of my students that build systems are starting to build things on top of those systems. Projects like MemGPT, uh, Gorilla are, are taking yeah, top three yeah. top three favorite projects that you, or not right, favorite because that's, that's unfair. That. Um, yeah. uh, th that that will cause too much pain on campus. Uh, but what what three projects that you think everyone should be watching now and following because they're 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 going to be that they're they're hitting the inflection point of uh, seminal change. Yeah. So. Uh, We'll start on the infra infrastructure front. We have a project called VLLM for my group that's uh, exploring how to, to make model delivery, model inference faster. It's an open platform. 
Uh, it doesn't support all the, the, I won't say the word, but various data formats, but the idea is it's an open platform that allows people to incorporate many of these open source models, serve them efficiently, and a lot of the research is going there. So if you're using open source models, you should probably be looking at that project. Um, on the agentic front, uh, so uh, LMs that, that iteratively think uh, and, and do complex reasoning, uh, the two big projects for my group, again, are Gorilla and MemGPT. Gorilla was uh, a project targeted at, at RAG for function calling, at retrieving APIs and then invoking them. Um, it, it spun off open functions, uh, a more recent effort to make it easy to use open source models to call your various libraries. Um, and then MemGPT, an adjacent project which essentially takes the limited context of, of LLMs and extends them essentially indefinitely using the paging ideas that we've already developed in computing by essentially asking the LM, hey, would you like to modify your context with new information, repeating that process. Um, and so that allows you to have very, very long conversations or reason about large sets of documents effectively. Um, so those are kind of the, the agentic space. Um, I made that one. Uh, I'll, I'll give you uh, one more project that's, that's new. We haven't really announced anything about it yet. We've been thinking- Breaking. Yeah, breaking. Uh, we've been thinking a lot about integration of these technologies in the data analytics stack. Um, my bet for the future is that a lot of the LM calls, an application that will generate money, uh, is taking the text that I have in my data warehouse or in my data lake or modern data stack, whatever you want to call it, uh, and I applying LMs to pull out information from that text. You know, compare this customer response with the you know support ticket. Did the ticket address the response? Were there things that were left behind? Uh, yes, no. So maybe I'm, I'm reducing a lot of text to a yes or no. Classically, we would train a a scikit-learn model, maybe a, a deep neural net to do these with some training data. Now I can give an LM a few examples in context prompting uh, and have it help me reason about my data. But that gets expensive. Millions of rows hitting an LLM is hard. And so we've been thinking a lot about how to reorganize data. Simple things like sorting your data, reorganizing the columns can make a big difference in how much things like VLM can reuse computation. Uh, so if I've seen the same, same su substring before, I don't have to run the billions of calculations for each word in that substring. Yeah. Um, so a lot of excitement, I think, will be in the future around how we integrate these technologies into batch analytics work. Something that is uh, definitely thematic through the, the, the different tracks later today. I know Carlos and uh, uh, Daniel and I have talked a, a lot about these, these sort of angles.